Um, last two sessions of the day, it's been a great day. It's been great hearing about all the other um, talks as well. If we venture back to this morning uh, for, for Yah and Ronnie's um, sessions, hopefully that inspired you, motivated you to start thinking about how you're going to create an experimentation organization. And I'm going to talk about some of the tactics you can use, some of the steps that you can introduce to your organization today, in addition to experiment or die messaging that Ronnie suggested. There's other tactics you can use as well. Um, and guys, let me know if my Irish accent gets too much. Um, I'm currently using my international voice as much as I can. So if it does drop, just let me know and I'll try and readjust. Um, so I want to start off with one of my favorite quotes. Um, if you're Picasso, don't A-B test. But for the rest of us, it's humbling to evaluate our ideas. And you know you've been invited to a great conference when you get to actually quote one of your fellow speakers and get your illustrators to make a great illustration of Picasso um, and, and, his, and his paintings. But experimentation has been a really key part of Skyscanner. Um, we started experimenting heavily in kind of 2012, 2013, and it's been a real driver in, in our growth. Um, our experimentation has actually uh, driven our culture in product, design, engineering, um, just across disciplines in our organization. So for people who don't know who Skyscanner is, um, we're a travel search engine, and we provide cheap flights, cheap hotels, car rental, and now trains. Um, we're industry leaders in EMEA and primarily the UK. Um, we have uh, some of our milestones is we have 70 million app downloads. Uh, we're available in 30 languages and 70 currencies. And we also have our um, travel APIs, widgets, and white labels for our B2B and strategic partners as well. So before I kind of get on to the tactics, I kind of just wanted to touch on what experimentation means at Skyscanner and what it's helped us to achieve. So at Skyscanner, a real goal for us for experimentation was democratizing it. Um, so we don't actually focus on how many um, experiments that we run, but rather we focus on how many teams, how many squads are experimenting. How are we decentralizing experimentation and making it accessible to the, the masses in our organization? So as you can see, as I say, this is the number of squads experimenting, and we, it's kind of just continuing on that upward trend that we continue to hope to develop as Skyscanner continues to grow. Um, and here's our 10 offices, which, as you can see, is global. They cover a lot of different time zones. And it's kind of just to highlight how much experimentation is happening across the globe for Skyscanner at any one time. So a main, main thing that experimentation helped us achieve is that product market fit. At Skyscanner, we worked to the kind of Spotify tribes and squad model. And one of the goals of experimentation we wanted to do was enable and empower our cultural experts to be able to run their own experiments. So what this means was, OK, if the, the Italian squad wants to create features or implement features that really resonate with our Italian users, let them be able to do that. If the Swedish users want to do the same thing with a, by our squ Swedish squad, let's empower them and enable us to do that. And having these foundations in place um, to kind of create this product market fit th with experimentation has allowed us to enter new markets as well. So it's kind of continuing to achieve that product market fit as we grow in EMEA, in the Middle East, in APAC and the Americas. So innovation. So I know obviously today there's been a lot of touching on how experimentation can kind of help with that continuous improvement, those iterative ex experiments. But it has also helped us um, at Skyscanner achieve those kind of moonshot experiments um, and helped us to get that bigger, bigger and better thinking. We use the analogy at Skyscanner, if we only ever do those small tests, we'll only ever get faster horses, but we'll never invent the automobile. Um, and that's something that we really focus on at Skyscanner. So I know there's lots of different um, definitions of innovation out there, um, but at Skyscanner, we categorize them into three. So now is the experiments that we've, we've previously done. We're making you know, optimizations on those are our existing channels. And something, maybe the French squad is something, has seen something that the Spanish squad are doing, Singapore squad, and something that can be lifted and replicated um, across our different squads and achieving that product market fit again. New is something new to Skyscanner, but maybe we've seen something similar in the industry. We've seen competitors um, experiment with something that we want to experiment as well for ourselves. And next, which is something completely new for the industry, and we want to be industry first in these things. So as you can guess, probably the smallest proportion is in this next category, but it's something that can bring the highest value. So we actually keep track of all the experiments that fall into each category. So we always know how much innovation is bringing to Skyscanner and its ex experimentation efforts. Um, and reporting on this and tracking on this is something that's really key for us. 
Okay, so once you introduce something to your organization, it can feel like a mountain, it can feel really daunting, but kind of identifying some quick, quick wins that you can adopt will really help with that kind of instant satisfaction, um, get people's buy-in, get people to kind of sit up and listen about this stuff. So I kind of wanted to talk about that. So when Skyscanner became an experimentation organization, we placed a real emphasis on that kind of hypothesis mindset, that hypothesis writing. Um, and we made that into a standardized, easy, and repeatable steps. We all know the benefits of standardization. It helps with cross-collaboration, getting people on board, um, helping people test effectively and quickly. But when you make something easy and repeatable, this soon becomes second nature. And that's what we really wanted to achieve when we started to introduce experimentation to Skyscanner, this hypothesis thinking. Every idea goes through an hypothesis. And here's a couple of formats that you can use. A simple kit, an advanced kit. Um, and it's just, it's just a, a kind of an easy way to introduce to your organization. So the simple kit, uh, simple kit base, we, uh, because we saw your data, your feedback, we expect an X change, we'll cause an X impact, and we'll me measure this using one of our key metrics. So we actually um, adopted the whole kind of standardized uh, approach to our whole testing cycle. I know Ronnie earlier was talking about the experimentation life cycle, and this kind of touches on this, but just breaks it down into kind of easy, digestible steps. So we have our define, design, develop, test, and learn, and our actions that we draw upon once we've concluded our experiments. Um, so because we've uh, adopted the standardized approach to our testing cycle, what that means is that our hypothesis, our test methodology, our learnings and recommendations are all reported on in the same way. So it's really easy to people to see experiments that have worked, use it for themselves. Um, but what I would say is when you're, when you're thinking about this stuff for your own organization, as long as you're reporting, um, it allows you to draw conclusions, take actions, and, something, and someone can learn from something, then that's good enough. So just whatever makes sense for your organization, how in depth you want to go into that. So just to go back to hypothesis writing, so this is our hypothesis kit that we created in our in-house experimentation platform called Dr. Jekyll. And we work to the mantra at Skyscanner, design like you're right, test like you're wrong. And what this is kind of just referring to is your alternative and null hypothesis with your power analysis below there. Um, I know the kind of alternative hypothesis is maybe more common in the industry or you maybe see that a little more often. But we wanted to put a real emphasis on the null hypothesis as well making sure our colleagues were scientific, that they were using the data to prove themselves wrong, not to prove themselves right, and to remove that confirmation bias as well. And, and this is one, if Colin, Colin McFarland ever sees this, who is the creator of Dr. Jekyll, uh, I wanted to let him know that we've rebranded since he's been at the company, so Dr. Jekyll has been reborn. Um, and to quote Colin, who's now um, Director of Experimentation at Netflix, learning something is more important than your idea. And Jan and Ronnie kind of touched on this um, idea of being able to accept failure in your organization. Um, at Skyscanner, we go one step for, further and start celebrating them, and celebrating them with cake. That is my main message, celebrate things with cake. Um, uh, we've got stickers with um, our term that we use, feel forward, at Skyscanner. Um, and it's just kind of celebrating this, really normalizing it, and getting people excited about that they failed, that they haven't moved a metric in the way that they thought, and kind of humbling our ideas again. And it's also just to remind ourselves that if an experiment has got you closer to a user, got you closer to a winner the next time around, give you an insight or helped you understand causal, um, causal impact, cause and effect, then the experiment has done exactly what it's designed to do. I think from the talks today, it's, you know, it's really easy to believe that a first implementation of a feature will really resonate with users. But this is rarely the case, and kind of normalizing this reality first and foremost when you're starting to become an experimentation organization is really, really important. So um, when I started my career in Skyscanner, I never thought my days would include p-values, confidence intervals, statistical significance, all these terms that we've heard today. But I think having a basic understanding of these terms can make a real difference in the experiments that are being run in your organization. I know, yeah, I kind of touched on where's that balance of um, how much do, does people need to know about this statistical knowledge, where's the balance of giving them too much information. But for Skyscanner, I wanted to kind of curate a, a baseline for the people that were joining our company. And it's kind of another way to indicate that this stuff is important for us. So at Skyscanner, we created our Experimentation 101 course, which is a self-serve course that every person in the company has to take. 
and it goes through each part of the testing cycle um, and kind of gives you a basic knowledge of the statistical terms, which I'll go into in a little bit. We also have our statistics for five-year-old courses, which I know would be five-year-old geniuses, but we, we thought the title was catchy. Um, and we run these kind of different workshops across the disciplines throughout the year. Okay, so I just want to give this quick example. Uh, it's kind of what I'm becoming known for in Skyscanner, explaining minimum detectable effect with bananas. Um, but it's just to highlight when you're starting off with experimentation, it doesn't have to be very heavy white papers. It doesn't have to be this kind of mystical language that maybe people aren't used to or don't know about, but just getting people to think about these things. So stick with me, I know it's late in the day, but if you have 10 bananas in your bunch and you wanna increase that bunch by 10, or no, by one, sorry, then your absolute change is one banana and your relative change is 10%. And then this kind of starts us help explain, okay, what's the minimum effective effect? What's the minimum amount of bananas that you'd be happy with if they were in your bunch? And then it's just kind of that fun way, making it accessible, making sure we're democratizing this stuff. So people can start asking these questions and draw back to metaphors. I'm very much a metaphor person, and it has really helped when people are starting off with these things. Another one is our average Joe running experiment. So what we did, we was uh, created a comic strip of average Joe. So when someone's ready to run their first experiment, you can follow along with Joe. She can go through each stage of the experimentation cycle. She describes what she's feeling, what she's struggling with, her emotions, um, and also the tools she's using as well. Again, just another fun thing to make this accessible across our organization. So level two, okay. Experimentation community, I've been so lucky working in this community for the last few years or so, everyone is always so open with their time and sharing their knowledge. I'm sure you've seen that here today. At Skyscanner, we've had speakers from Booking.com and um, Spotify and loads of people from different parts of the industry, all sharing their experiences and always being willing to, to share um, their experiences. Um, and I've, I've done the same for other industries as well, HSBC, New Balance, ING, and there's lots of cross collaboration across the industries. Um, we also had Chad Sanderson, um, who's in the area, which I can make an, introdu an introduction to, but he's done experimentation for Sephora, GoPro, and Subway. So really exciting people. But it's just reaching out, making these contacts. And what I'd encourage you guys to do today, which I'm sure you already have, but make contacts at, like, at events like this, listen to podcasts, reach out to people that create content on this stuff. It can make a huge difference. And I know there's loads of different events in this area. I know Split have a really great product experimentation meetup, which I'm sure Kimber will be able to share information on that in our Slack. So just use these resources that are here um, and start cir circulating this content around your organization. So if you start to think about, if no one's talking about experiments, no, no one knows what experiments are being run, it might come across that this isn't important to your organization, right? So start thinking about how you're making these experiments visible. We've, done, we've, we've tried a few different tactics, and these probably will have to continue to adapt as Skyscanner grows, but um, one of the things was we integrated a really powerful query engine. So someone can search for experiments based on a whole list of different attributes, whether it's app experiments run in our Singapore office, whether it's experiments that have failed in the past week or so, and it's just getting that visibility and circulations of experiments that are being run. We also have loads of different Slack integrations, which I'm sure most people can relate to. So if an app experiment is, is uploaded onto our system, that automatically goes to a Slack channel that people can watch and, and engage with. And we also have our newsletters, which circulates around different product experiments of the week or different innovative experiments of the week. I really loved an idea from another company, which was they sent a daily newsletter and they got their colleagues to vote for the variant they thought would be the winner. And I'm, as I'm sure you guys have guessed that then the next day they would show the variant that was the winner. Most people were wrong. Um, so it's just kind of highlighting this importance of experimentation, the value in it. Um, and I really love that idea of, of the daily newsletter just to prove how wrong we are. Okay, so emphasis on um, step zero. We at Skyscanner have a really user first approach. Um, and this is no different when it comes to experimentation. So we put a real emphasis on this kind of research um, piece, the, the, whether it's user testing, qualitative and quantitative, looking at what our competitors are doing, or um, user, user interviews, um, and gathering as many insights and data as, as possible before we even started thinking about an experimentation design. And this builds up insights and opportunity. So we actually devised um, a step zero workshop with, uh, this is us with our car rental team. And I look so happy in this picture because our car rental team is based in Barcelona 
and I'm based in Scotland. So this is the first time I've seen sun in two months. Um, and I know you guys can't relate because we're in California, but I'm happy. I'm happy about, about seeing some sun. But what we did, we got our product managers to kind of lay out their product vision, their product objectives for the next six to 12 months. And we also got them to lay out all the insights, the user insights that they had already generated and started connecting the dots between these two with experimentation. And what you get is something like this. Um, and experimentation is that bridge of insights and objectives and making sure every experiment is tied back to an objective, whether it's market, whether it's a business objective or your product objective in general. So our kind of next step was thinking about how do we turn this into how might we questions to if and then to experimentation design. Um, one of the insights from the workshop was our users didn't really understand what were the card types that we could offer in our product. Um, and we wanted to tailor this to every single market. So what you can do, as I say, create this to the how might we if and then experiment design. So how might we adjust our filters in our product to show the right different um, car filters, car types for the specific needs of a market? If we test different visuals for car types, then we can learn more about the types of, uh, types of visual uh, stimuli that users respond to. And the experimentation design, should we test illustrations of car types versus car, um, actual photos of car types? And probably, as you've seen from my presentation, Skyscanner loves an illustration. Um, so we always want to kind of test that out. Um, and there's some more, um, so this kind of creates an experimentation tree and there's some really great content on this by Simon Cast. Um, I can drop the, the link to the blog post later, but um, he talks about everything uh, experimentation is needed to know by product managers. Um, and this, just how you can kind of create this experimentation tree from your insights, from your objectives and connecting this all together. Hippos, another hippo. But it's just to re-emphasize that let users kill your ideas, not hippos. Um, we, we no longer have those added extras, um, extra layers of bureaucracy, those sign-off meetings um, and things like that. We're always getting closer and closer to our user and experimentation is the best way to do that. Okay, time to build your experimentation army. So as I say, we really want to democratize experimentation. We want to decentralize it and give a chance for everyone to experiment. Um, and what we wanted to do is kind of create those layers of experiments, uh, experimentation experts. So we identified people from our APAC region, EMEA, Americas, and we invested extra time, training efforts for uh, support from our data scientists and get these people up to a really high bar. Uh, and then with the thought that they would kind of go back to their squads and share this knowledge. And, you know, they're dedicated to time and um, to creating the experimentation culture in their region, in their offices. And this has worked really well for us. Oh, that's a slide. Um, so running a bad experiment is worse than not running experiment at all. So on that, Process of peer review. A peer review is probably something that you've heard around in the scientific research community. In this community, it's kind of jokingly described as a bloodbath. Um, we thought a great, what a great thing to introduce into Skyscanner. Um, so we introduced this um, last year, um, and it helps us really continue to, to marketize experimentation and increase the quality of this stuff. What happens is our experimentation army start reviewing, once they feel confident running experiments, they start asking the experimenters who are doing the experiment for the first time, just things like, is this hypothesis testable? Have, they, have you chosen the right metric? Is your experiment being run for your business cycles? Things like this that they maybe not have thought of initially. Um, and we kind of see like the next generations um, buddying up with people who are reviewing so they can review the next time as well. So it's kind of this continuing process. Every six months or so, we get people into the experimentation army, get them to run experiments, um, and kind of engage in this process of peer review. So hopefully when you've got to this point, you've identified co uh, your colleagues or employees that are really passionate about this kind of stuff. Um, at Skyscanner, we have two medium blogs on dedicated to engineering and growth, and we talk about experimentation all the time, um, whether it's app experiments, perspectives from data science, and things like that. And it's just an indication, both externally and internally, that experimentation is important to us. And that's always great to hit home with your colleagues. Um, so I would definitely encourage you guys to check it out. But creating content on this stuff is, I think, is really important. And I know Kevin's online for you know writing blog posts, so another one on experimentation would be great. Um, and then kind of touching on what Adel said in the, in the session earlier of thinking about what are people being rewarded for in your organization. 
is experimentation being part of that career progression for your colleagues or employees? Um, and not kind of falling into the trap that someone has to run X amount of experiments, but rather, are, they, are your colleagues being data driven? Are they testing their assumptions? Are they engaging in peer review if that's something that you choose to adopt? Um, are they sharing their learnings and recommendations? And all this stuff is really important for experimentation. And if people are being rewarded for that, that's only just going to continue to increase the quality of experiments being run in your organization. So what I would say is that experimentation can open up so many doors for your product development, for your growth in your organization. It's, I think it's a really exciting time to be in the experimentation community and environment and definitely utilize it with the people that are here today. Um, so that is me. Thank you so much for your time, and I'll catch you guys for the Q&A.